So um, my name is Kyle Thomas. I am from uh, Thrive Community, and I am uh, going to be reading from the book of John, chapter 13, verses 1 through 17. Sorry, I didn't oh. I wonder if they prepared slides for me. Yeah. All right. Jesus washes his disciples' feet. Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour and um, had come to depart from the world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, all right, it's hard to read in the dark. Uh, now, when it was time for supper, the day had already put into the heart of Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had given everything into his hands, that he had come from God, and that he was going back to God. So he got up from supper, laid aside his outer clothing, took a towel, and tied it around himself. Next, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet to dry them, and dry them with the towel tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I'm doing you, do, you don't realize now, but afterward you will understand. You will never wash my feet, Peter said. Jesus replied, If I don't wash, your, wash you, you have no part with me. Hey, thanks. <laughs> Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. One who has bathed, Jesus told him, doesn't need to wash anything except his feet, but he is completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. This is why he said, not all of you are clean. When Jesus had washed their feet and put on his outer clothing, he reclined again and said to them, Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are speaking rightly, since this, that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done for you. Truly I tell you, a servant is not greater than his master, and a messenger is not greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. So, in reading this, this part, this message has always been very, very personal to me. I've always enjoyed reading this. Um, I like to focus on those last four, those last five verses. Or excuse me, three verses. I can count. I promise. <laughs> um, where he says, "I've showed you, you need to wash each other's feet." But it's not even just that. It's I, you are to give to one another. It's the idea of servitude. Now, in in our world, we kind of have a, I guess. I call it a corrupted view of the word servant or servitude, servanthood, and I think that's because a lot of us relate servants to slavery and stuff like that, which is completely not what he's talking about here. He's talking about giving of yourself to one another, of loving. He says several times in chapters before, um, you know, you, you came and gave me food when I was hungry, you gave me water when I was thirsty, you clothed me when I needed clothes. This is giving of ourselves, not for our own gain, but because we're trying to give to others. We are serving them. It's the same as, you know, if I see someone on the side of the street, you know, I, I do my best to help them as well as I can. So this has always been a very, very important thing for me because less than 24 hours later, Jesus is giving without a doubt, the most important service anyone has ever given humanity. Because less than 24 hours later, he's hanging on that cross and is dying for us. And the hands that are nailed to that cross are the same hands that were washing feet 24 hours before, and those are the hands that shape the universe. So, I mean, that's, that's beyond servitude. If, if he can do that, then we can easily do that. Um, I know not a lot of us like the whole feet touching, washing thing, but still. Um, but I always relate this servitude to just the giving of yourself, of just the absolute, just full-on commitment love that we have for one another. He says, not long after this, he says, the greatest love is this, for him who gives his life for his brother or for his friend. So in closing, I, I just I thought of it this afternoon, um, and you can bear with me if all you want on this. Uh, 
there's an old Irish parable that is that always reminds me of this about serving one another, giving yourself for them. Um, it's about a man who dies and he goes to heaven. And he's standing before St. Peter and he says, can I please be let in? St. Peter says, well, of course, just show us your scars. The man proudly says, well, I have no scars. And St. Peter says, what a pity. Was there nothing worth fighting for? That is what servitude calls us for. It's not, we're not the warriors in this. The war is already won. The battle is won. That has already been done. But we're to bring people to Christ. We're to help those around us and we're to show them his love through our service. Thank you. And so the story continues. I'm reading from Luke 22, verse 14. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. I want to focus on those words, the new covenant in his blood. A lot of times when we take communion, we, we think about, and rightly so, the cross, where Jesus' body was broken and he shed his blood. But in this particular reading, he talks about something else, the new covenant. And the new covenant should get us thinking about what is the old covenant. When he was talking to his disciples, they were in the middle of the Jewish Passover Seder meal. They were thinking about that time from generations before when God rescued their country out of slavery in Egypt. And the angel of death passed over their homes because they had followed God obediently and sacrificed the Passover lamb, covering their door frames with the blood of the lamb. They then were able to be freed from slavery in Egypt through the Exodus. They crossed through the Red Sea and eventually they came to Mount Sinai where God entered into covenant with the people. We sometimes call it the Mosaic Law, but it was a, co a covenant between God and his people. And in the covenant, he said, you will be my people and I will be your God. And simply put, the covenant was the terms of what needed to happen in order to perpetuate that relationship. And God said to them, if you obey me, you will be blessed. But if you disobey, you will be cursed. Sadly, we know the, the wider story of the nation of Israel and how in the end there was great rebellion. We come to prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and God declares through them, sadly, with a broken heart, that the covenant had been broken, just like his heart. Israel had turned their backs on him. But through the prophets, like in Jeremiah, he foretold of a time when he would make a new covenant with his people that their hearts of stone would be turned into hearts of flesh, that a Messiah would come. And Jesus is harnessing that image of the new covenant, and he is declaring to his disciples around that table that it's about to happen in his blood. Through his death and resurrection, God was entering into a new way of relating to all humanity. No longer was it going to be a covenant about a biological people or a geographical piece of land. It was a new covenant for the whole world through the blood of Jesus. And so this is a moment where we can rejoice that God has desired to be in relationship in covenant with us. Through his body broken, his blood shed on the cross, and of course, the victory that he wins a few days later 
rising from the dead. I'd like for all of you, if you can just imagine the upper room and Jesus sitting there with his disciples, the emotions that he was going through, knowing he was going to be betrayed, denied, and failed in the Garden of Gethsemane, beaten and crucified. Disciples didn't quite understand, but he loved them and he wanted to teach them one thing, and that was to love one another. And after Judas had left, Jesus and the other disciples in the upper room, Jesus had known that um, he had a lot to talk about. And the one thing he wanted to talk about was teaching them love. He wanted them to know that loving would show the world that they were followers of Jesus. So Jesus had something to say. He had lots to say. And I will be reading from John 13, 35 to 30, or excuse me, 33 to 35. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where am I going? You cannot come. A new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. He said, as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This is the first time in the Gospels Jesus t tenderly uses the word, my children, or little children. Jesus assumes the role of a teacher to children, and from Jesus' point of view, they were children, <coughs> immature students of Jesus, still trying to figure it out. With his loved ones gathered around, he gazed at them, knowing he would soon leave them. Like children, without a father, orphans. Jesus, knowing the victory ahead, spoke again softly, emotionally, and with intensity of parting love. He gives them a new commandment. Actually, it was an old one, but new in the sense which became the mark of the special bond Jesus created by his love for his disciples. He wants his di disciples to act on their faith during his last supper with the disciples, he simply encouraged them to love one another. Not just to love one another, to love as Jesus has loved. This was a group of men set apart from the rest of the world that was to love one another, to let all men know they are disciples of Jesus. This is how the world will know we are his followers. Love will be the fruit the sign, the proof. Jesus created a group identified by one thing, love. There are many groups in the world and they identify themselves in a number of ways, by the color of our skin, uniforms we wear, shared interests, and the way we dress and so on. How did Jesus love? He loved with humility. He loved unconditionally sacrificially. He loved with forgiveness and he loved eternally. Jesus' love is holy. <clears throat> Descendant moral purity. Behold what peculiar out of this world kind of love the Father has bestowed upon us. This agape love which gives nothing expected in return seems strange to the world because it is so pure and holy. The highest point of Christ's amazing love for us is his death on the cross, his burial, and the body resurrection. Believers are to love each other like that. We also must show love to our friends, to our family members, to neighbors, and to co-workers. Even enemies are recipients of Christ's love. Jesus had such compassion for hungry, for the sick, for the fearful, and the vulnerable. 
Jesus spent his life putting aside status in order to serve. He confronted the greedy and those using God's name to accumulate power for themselves. In a startling act of humble service, he gets down on the floor to wash the feet of his followers. And soon after, he went to the cross in the most stunning display of love in history. Christ's love displayed by the disciples was not of the flesh. Love of the flesh is selfish, egotistical, unforgiving, and insincere. Verse 34 contains one of the most powerful commands given to Christians, that love for others is the defining sign of faith for all people. Marking the life of a true believer. Dear friends, God, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Can you imagine sitting at the table, breaking the bread and drinking the wine and sharing from his heart? One last time he prayed for his friends and he also prayed for all who would believe their word. Friend, that means you. That means everyone who has trusted in him. <coughs> Jesus last night before dying, the one thing he asked was to be unified. For us to be knit together in love so the whole world would recognize Jesus in us. It is a sacred invitation, as important today as it was then. So dear friends, <coughs> Our marching order is to love in the way Jesus loved. This is how the world will know we are his. This is how the world will know him. When we think about Maundy Thursday, we typically think about the Last Supper and the Lord Jesus breaking the bread, his body, and spilling the wine, his blood, given up for the many. We think of the selfless sacrifice of taking on the world's sin, our sin now, our sin then, and until the end of time. Jesus, as aware of his situation and fate as he was, felt anxiety and fear begin to creep in. The anxiety and fear that can only come with owning a mortal body, a flesh and bone. Perpetually aware of and prepared for the fate of his earthly body, he feared. After Jesus foretold his predictions, he gathered his disciples and departed for the Mount of Olives. At the base of the mountain, he told his disciples to stay and pray, save Peter, James, and John, after which he became vocally distressed. According to Mark chapter 14, verse 34, he said to the disciples, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Now I can only imagine the images that flashed in Jesus' mind, the many lashings upon his body, the blood dripping from his forehead and exposed sinew, his lungs barely able to draw breath because of the weight of being suspended on the cross. He knew from the beginning that he was going to die the most painful death that anyone can experience. Once he confided in his closest disciples, his friends, Jesus prayed. Mark 14, 36 states, Abba, Father, he cried out, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. It's that last part that really matters. Jesus prayed this prayer not once, not twice, but three times. Luke's depiction of the prayer in the garden says that an angel from heaven appeared to strengthen Jesus' spirit, yet he was still in such agony that he sweat blood. Jesus understood what it meant to drink the, cups, the cup of God's wrath, as it did Prior to, he would be handed over to a Gentile nation and he would be subjected and killed by them. Still, he begged his father, if there be another way, please spare me from this fate. Mark goes on to write in verse 38 that Jesus says to his disciples, Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation, for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He directly reflects the emotions that he himself is feeling and is trying to teach his disciples a valuable lesson 
on spiritual strength and pleasing God. Sometimes our desires conflict with God's will, but in the end, it's not our desires that matter. We don't have the ability to see things on an eternally cosmic scale like God can. For us to say that our desires are more important or take higher priority than the will of God is like a sailor insisting on sailing south when the compass is guiding him north. When the sailor sails south and acts on his desires, he risks storms, losing his way, and perhaps even sinking. I'm sure we can all relate to this, but you have a great weekend and you go in Monday morning. I don't really want to be at work. Um, does that mean I should turn around and leave because I don't want to? No. You make it through the day because you understand that it's going to pay off. The same can be said about spiritual struggles. It can be a lot easier to complain about things that have happened in our lives and run from God's will. But this is what Jesus is warning against. The body, our temptations, our doubts, and our sin weakens us. But as long as the spirit is willing, God can help us conquer anything that falls under his will. None of us will ever need to endure the pain and suffering Jesus went through. But Jesus went through it gracefully and with faith. Most would run to spare themselves the fate of such a cruel death. Instead, Jesus prayed, and he asked us all to do the same. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter how stressed or physically drained we are. God wants us to trust in him and rely on his judgment because we can't begin to comprehend his plans. Good evening. My name is Kirk Marks, and I'm from Faith Church. I've got the uh, shortest verse this evening, and uh, I have the most difficult topic to talk about, so I'm going to take the most time to do that. We'll see how that actually turns out or not. Uh, John chapter 17, we have Jesus' high priestly prayer, where Jesus is praying for himself, for his disciples, and then those who will believe because of their testimony. So really praying for all believers. And in the middle of that prayer, Jesus prays, Father, for his disciples he prays, Father, grant that they may be one as we are one. So my message is about Christian unity in a divided world. Now, I, I don't have to say anything about our divided world, our divided society, the divisions that we have, things have been dividing us for a long time. Through COVID, we discovered new ways of being divided and those divisions have come some into the church and caused us problems. Um, that's not what Jesus wanted when he prayed, that we would be united as his followers. So let's talk about that unity and being united. Now, when Jesus prayed, may they be one as we are one. This is Jesus, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, saying to this heavenly Father, God the Father, may they be one as we are one. I don't have time to talk about the Trinity and all those kinds of things, but I think we can all understand that there's a deep, deep, intimate unity of Heavenly Father and Son of God together on the same page and not always doing the same things, but all together, one God in three persons and those two persons together. Well, God wants to, Jesus wanted his followers to be united in that same way. Well, what does that unity look like? What, what does it mean to be united? How are we united as, as Christians? I think we could kind of describe that as we are united in purpose, we are united in identity, and we are united in that love that Billy was talking about. We're united in purpose in that we all have the purpose of following Jesus, wanting to be his followers, to live like he lived, to be and to make disciples as he told us to be. We're united in identity like Frank was talking about. We were there when Jesus died. We were there. We are in Christ as Paul described. We're united in identity. We're united in purpose and we're united in belief as well. Uh, if I were to ask, or if I were just to ask you to, to say some things that divide Christians, it wouldn't take long for somebody to say, oh, theology, theology divides Christians, you know, Calvinists, Arminians, Catholic, Protestant, those kinds of things. But actually, theology was invented to unite Christians, and it does. We all believe and, and know that we have a heavenly Father 
And we believe in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We have those basic beliefs that we share together that unite us and bring us together. As we think about those things that unite us, it's important for us to understand too that that unity that we have is not uniformity. We all don't have to be exactly alike, and we're, we're going to be different. This is very obvious from Scripture. Take Jesus' 12 disciples. There were different kinds of guys. They had different personalities, different skills and abilities, uh, different ideas even about how to follow Jesus when they did those things. If you've seen the, any of the TV program, The Chosen, this displays this really well. And after Jesus died and rose and ascended into heaven and those disciples became apostles and went out, uh, we see in the book of Acts all different ways in which they ministered and worked and planted churches and the different and sometimes the different opinions and ideas they had about how that was going to work that even came into conflict with each other sometimes. Uh, not uniform, but united. Uh, Paul talks about this when he talks about the Holy Spirit. Uh, when the Holy Spirit comes to all of us, so there again is a way that we're united. We all have the Holy Spirit at work within us, the Holy Spirit bringing about that fruit of the Spirit in all of us. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. All of that's being brought about the Holy, by the Holy Spirit in all of us. But those gifts of the Spirit, the Spirit gives to us, are all very different. Paul talks about that beautifully with his illustration of the body. There is one body, but many parts. Each of those parts is important. If they were all the same, it wouldn't work. They need to be different, and that's how it works, and that's how we as God's followers and God's people are. United, but not uniform. We have different personalities, different gifts, different skills and abilities, sometimes different opinions and different ideas, and those things sometimes rub up against each other. That doesn't mean that we're not unified just because we don't have that uniformity all the time. And that's very, very important to know and an important mistake not to make. And uh, churches that I've been in parts of, I've seen this happen from time to time when that non-uniformity comes together. People have different ideas and we're trying to work through some differences or some different opinions that we have. And as we're working through those, even in a very healthy way, sometimes somebody will say, wait a minute, wait a minute, this isn't right. We're supposed to be unified. Jesus wanted us to be unified and we're not unified. And then, well, what does that mean? Well, that means that somebody's the bad guy then because they're keeping us from being unified. And you always know who the bad guy is in those situations, right? The person who doesn't agree with me. They're, they're the bad guy. And then it's a good guys and bad guys thing. You know that Jesus never operated that way. Uh, to the bad guys, Jesus always reached out in love. There he was hanging on the cross saying, what about the bad guys? God, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus uh, came into conflict with the Pharisees, but invited them to believe in him and to follow him and to hear what he was saying. So we don't have to reduce our, our differences, our differences of opinions to uh, being divided and to let them be divisions. We can have those things and work through those things. And I would like very briefly to say four things we need to remember that help us to prevent those differences that we have, those differences of opinion, from becoming divisions. The first one of those I don't have to say anything about because Billy already beautifully said it. What did Jesus tell us to do? Love one another as I have loved you. Love covers over a multitude of disagreements, doesn't it? And we can disagree and work through our disagreements in love. We do it in our families all the time. We can do it as brothers and sisters in the Lord. Love one another. Secondly, it's something I've already mentioned, and that's the fruit of the Spirit. You know, if we can, through disagreements and differences of opinion, and even sometimes dislike of one another, show love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control to each other, that takes us a long way from being divided and binds us together with those bounds of love that we have. For my third and fourth thing, I'd like to take us just real briefly to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He said two things in that message that really help us with these things. Maybe you're already thinking about something 
um, that Jesus addressed in that Sermon on the Mount. Okay, sometimes we have disagreements, we have differences of opinions that can be minor kinds of things, but what if it's major, okay? What if we have really major disagreements and fights with each other? I mean, we really get upset with somebody else. We really don't like what they're saying. Oh my goodness, if we do what they suggest we do, our, our church will fall apart, our ministry will suffer, we won't be able to survive. What if we have major disagreements? Now, you know what the world tells us about major disagreements? It says that there's a line, and once people cross it, then it's okay to be mad at them. Then it's okay to condemn them. Then it's okay to get nasty with them. It's okay to call names. It's okay to do whatever you have to do to prevail in that situation, because the conflict is worth it. It's worth it. That person makes me so upset. They are just my enemy. What did Jesus tell us about dealing with our enemies? He said, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. The world's not telling us the truth or what is right. There is no line that if you cross it, you don't have to love them anymore and you don't have to show them the fruit of the Spirit. There is no line. No matter how upset you are with someone, no matter how much you disagree with them, you still must show them that love that Jesus showed. Still must seek to show the fruit of the Spirit in all of those things. Now that's hard. I know that's hard. That's easy to say. That's really hard to do. But the fourth thing that helps us prevent our disagreements from becoming divisions is even harder. Um, but Jesus said it right at the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. You know, the Sermon on the Mount begins with those uh, Beatitudes. You know, the, the blessed are, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the meek, blessed are the peacemakers. Jesus started with, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed, I always thought that was strange. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Shouldn't it be the opposite? Blessed are the, the rich in spirit, the spiritual. That's what we want to be, right? We want to be spiritual. We want to have this godliness thing figured out. We want to have all the right answers and be a, a font of wisdom. Well, that's the way the Pharisees kind of approached their religion, and Jesus really didn't like that very much, and said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Who are the poor in spirit? The poor in spirit are the people who don't have it all figured out and know they don't. People who know they need God. They know they need a savior in Jesus Christ. They know they need the Holy Spirit to lead them into all things. I, I pray every day for God to make me poor in spirit and help me to be more of that in that way because people who are poor in spirit know that they may not be right about everything. That's another mistake our world's made that sometimes comes into the church that feeds our divisions. We trade being right for being Christ-like and do the opposite. Instead of prioritizing being Christ-like, what's most important is that we're right, that we prevail. That's not being poor in spirit as Jesus taught us. If we can be poor in spirit, humbly hold the things we, we think are important and humbly be able to say to people, I might not be right about these things, it takes us a long way toward finding places of unity and coming together. So if we can, through our differences, even through our disagreements, love one another, show the fruit of the Spirit. If we can, in those things, love even when we disagree with someone so much we think they're our enemy, if we can still insist on loving them and always hold those things humbly and let a humility and a poverty of spirit go ahead of those things, we can, I believe, indeed see Jesus' prayer answered that we might be one as he and the Father are one. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. My name is Joel Lisey, uh, and I'm from Faith Church. Uh, and I'm going to be speaking on John 17, verses 15 through 19. <clears throat> so I'll start with that. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. And that is Jesus' words. So I'd like to highlight a key word. Uh, for my 
simplicity when I look at verses. I, uh, I like to zoom out and look at some verses before that and some verses after that. Um, I'm not sure in your personal lives if you've experienced it, but I've experienced verses that were taken out of context because they took just that verse and applied it to just their situation. And thankfully I've become aware of that. Um, but so yeah, I like to zoom out and look around everything and just help put all the pieces together. But in that verse there, the key word that I'd like to ha highlight is sanctify. And that meaning is to set apart for sacred use, cleansed and made holy. This is the exciting part, because how amazing is it to be known, once we accept Jesus as our Savior, we are sanctified. We are set apart, cleansed, and made holy. And how amazing it is to be known by our powerful God and have an eternal home with Him in heaven. But, and there's always a but, we are told it isn't a done deal. It isn't the end of life here on earth or the end of our suffering alongside every other human. Now this is the intimidating part. We are instructed to be disciples and to bring others to know the love of God and the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. So there is work to be done. And literally that definition of sanctified says it. We are set apart for sacred use. And that one little word, three letters, use, U-S-E. I looked it up in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, and it describes it as to put into action or service. He's got us. We got work to do. So let's take a look before the verse, verses 15 and 19, and get a little better picture. So I'm jumping into John 17, forward more, in verses 6 through 9. And let me read that. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world but for those you have given me, for they are yours. Again, Jesus' words to God. So I sat back and looked at verse 9. Quote, I am not praying for the world, end quote. So that was like unsettling to me. God created the earth and everything in it. But here Jesus clearly says, I am not praying for the world. Geez, thanks. That's great for the non-believers. But there's always a but, and this is spelled out loud and clear. Remember verse 15, right away Jesus saying, protect them from the evil one. That is Satan, who's in this world attempting to make it his world. Jesus was praying for us, knowing the struggle we live with as sin claws at us daily. And so the beginning of our sacred use and being put into service to resist Satan and the sin of this world, to pursue a place in heaven with Jesus, and to share that with everyone. That right there is not something of this world. That is of Jesus and God. And we are put into action with that. And so here's what I think is the punchline of John 17. It's verse 16 where Jesus says, They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. We as faithful believers of Jesus chose the path, this path, and that puts us in line with Jesus and God above. This does set us apart from the pursuit of worldly pleasures and satisfactions. So remember our key word in the beginning, sanctify? It's not satisfied. Again, put to service. We're not given satisfaction once we're believers to just sit back, kick our feet up, and watch who else might or might not make it to heaven. Jesus was sent to us to give us the truth, and verse 17 says it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As we find that truth to be true in each of our lives, it then becomes our responsibility to spread that truth. 
putting us into service. Verse 18, as you sent me into the world, Jesus speaking, I have sent them into the world. There's work to be done. It's go time. But a little more clarity from the next two verses. So again, broadening the picture and jumping ahead a little bit. Uh, in verses 20 and 21, they read, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. These verses tell us that Jesus was not sent for the world. Jesus did not pray for the world. He was sent for you and I and anyone else who will believe. The war on earth has been going since the serpent in the garden, and the war will wage on until Jesus returns. God, being all-powerful, still gave us a choice, and thankfully, Jesus showed us the truth and called on us to share that truth before we depart this world. So I'd like to leave us thinking this. It's obvious that once we accept Christ into our lives, we don't immediately disappear from this world and rest easy with him. Instead, we are put into action. We are used for the sacred use of spreading the truth of God's kingdom. We should not wish and pray to be removed from this world. We should embrace the life we are given and carry God's truth so everyone can have the choice we have to believe and have eternal life in heaven. I want to start out this evening with a question. Has anybody here ever really blown it really bad? I mean, let somebody down severely to the point where when you're faced with the individual that you've let down, you are just filled with grief and shame for all of the stuff that took place. What I want to do is I want to talk tonight, um, if you have your Bibles with you, um, turn to John chapter 21. We're going to look at verses 15 through 19. But before we do that, while you're turning there, I want to talk a little bit about what took place beforehand, what kind of led up to this moment. Scripture says that, or if you look at, at the Scriptures and you look at Peter, Peter was always the one person that always seemed to say the right thing. You know, Jesus said, you know, you are the rock. He, he said the correct thing, so Jesus changed his name. But it's interesting how almost immediately after he said the right thing, he said the wrong thing and got rebuked. And so Peter, I, I always imagined Peter was kind of like a toddler that was always looking for Jesus' approval. And he was always trying to get close to Jesus, trying to do the right things and say the right things. And in Matthew... I want to read here for you um, just a little bit about what took place before the Last Supper. So, a second here. All right, so Jesus tells the disciples in verse 31, chapter 26, verse 31, he says, This very night you will, fall, you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. But Peter replied, this is the Peter that always says the right things, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. <laughs> Jesus says, you know, I, I can almost see Jesus chuckling when he says this too. He says, truly I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. So... Of course, Peter, he wants to argue with Jesus about it, but Jesus, Jesus said it, it's going to happen. And later on, down the line, when Jesus is arrested, Jesus is standing before the Sanhedrin. He's being judged by the religious leaders of the day. And Peter is standing outside the Sanhedrin, and three times he denies him. And then the, the, the rooster crows. And so Jesus told him it was going to happen, and yet Peter was so distraught, he was so upset that he ran. He took off. But now fast forward. Jesus was crucified. He goes to the cross. He dies. He's taken down. He's buried. 
He, three days later, he raises from the dead and he appears to the disciples in the upper room. He tells Thomas, put your, your hands in, or put your hand in my side, put your fingers in the nail holes. See, it really is me. And yet, even though Peter can see all this and he sees Jesus standing there, he saw the empty tomb. Even though he's a witness to all this, he's filled with grief because he promised Jesus he was going to stand up for him and he wound up denying him three times. So even though Peter sees all this, he's still crushed inside. And there comes a point after they see him in the upper room where Peter and some of the disciples say, we're going to go back to what we do best. Let's go fishing. And they go out on the, on the Sea of Galilee and they start fishing. And while they're out there, now in John chapter 21, <coughs> while they're out there, starting in verse 15, or actually, I'm sorry, not starting in verse 15. He starts in verse 1. But Jesus appears to them on the beach, essentially. And he calls out to them. He says, friends, do you have any fish? And this is actually in verse 5. And they said, no. He says, throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you're going to find some. And when they did, they weren't able to haul the net in for the sheer amount of fish that they caught. And Peter realizes it's the Lord, so he goes swimming. He dives in. And he swims to shore. And when he gets there, Jesus is cooking breakfast. He's got the fish out. He's got the fire going. And, sorry. Jesus says to Peter, now we're starting in verse 15. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus says, feed my lambs. A little while later again, Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Now I'm going to stop there for a minute. I had read this passage since being a believer many, many times, and you could read through it never knowing anything else and kind of gloss over what's really happening here. Now we can, we can see and even infer that the reason why Jesus asked him three times was because Peter denied him three times and this was his way of restoring Peter. However, there's more that's going on beneath the surface here. In the original language, when Jesus says to Peter the first time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Jesus uses the word agape. Peter, will you lay your life down for me? And Peter responds, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. When Peter responds back, Peter uses the word phileo. Does that word sound familiar? Peter is saying to Jesus, Lord, I only can love you like a brother. Jesus says, that's okay. Take care of my sheep or feed my lambs. The second time, Jesus says to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Again, Jesus uses the word agape. Would you lay your life down for me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Peter again replies with the phrase phileo. Lord, I only love you like a brother. And Jesus says, take care of my sheep. The third time that Jesus addresses Peter and says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Jesus uses the word phileo. Do you love me like a brother? And Peter, I can almost see the look on Peter's face. He gets this look like, now you've got it. I can't lay my life, everything that just took place, I cannot lay my life down for you. But I can love you like a brother. And Jesus says, that's okay. Feed my sheep. And then it goes on, Jesus goes on to say, Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. 
And then it, this is the key. Jesus said, Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. Here, Peter is saying, Lord, with everything that just took place, I stood outside the Sanhedrin and denied knowing you. I can't lay my life down for you right now, but you will always be my brother. And Jesus said, that's okay. Feed my sheep, take care of my lambs, take care of them. But Jesus is saying here at the end, there's going to come a point in the future where you are in fact going to lay your life down for me. Feed my sheep. Think about that for a minute. Peter betrayed Jesus in that he denied him. And Jesus is like, I understand. It's okay. If you've ever felt in your life like you've let God down. And you just, you can't approach him. Lord, I'm too dirty. I, I can't. I'm not. Jesus says, it's okay. In just a, a couple of short hours before this conversation took, actually, excuse me, a couple of days before this took place, Jesus went to the cross knowing that Peter was going to deny him and he loves him anyway. If you are not sure, if you're sitting here tonight and, and things have been going on in your life and things are just, they're just not where they should be and your walk just isn't, Jesus says, it's okay. I came here for you. I did this for you. It's okay. Feed my sheep. The Lord laid his life down willingly, voluntarily, for you, for you, for you, for me. And it's okay where we are. He knows where we are. He asked me, there are certain things he asks us, you heard tonight, to love one another, okay? To, to show the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit to one another. But it's okay if we're not quite there yet. But Jesus is still here for us. He still loves us. It's not just Peter that he came back to restore. It was all of us. Thank you.